of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. You know, we live in a world that is under the curse of sin. Genesis 3 is where that happened. Because, beloved, this is a sin-cursed world. There is trouble, there is trials, there are hurts, there are pains, there are sorrows, there's sadness, there's death. And we all, living in this world, experience these things, sometime or another. Maybe you are experiencing some trial right now, some trouble, some heartache. I want to ask you a question. Through all that, through all the, the, the suffering and the hurt and the pain and the troubles and the sorrows of this world, can you see God? Can you see that God is good? Can you see that? That's what this message is about. Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading with verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 10, and then I'm going to jump down to two more verses in this chapter. The Bible says, and y'all bear with me because you know my eyes are not good. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree wherein I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And then I want to drop down to verse 15. And I will put, now this is God talking to the serpent. And he says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And then in verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, how we praise you today. How we thank you today. God, as we read thy word about this account of the fall of man, God, it breaks our heart. It breaks our heart. Man should be so de deceived by the wicked one. 
breaks our heart, God, when we think of all the sorrow and sadness and tragedy and pain and suffering and struggle that God, that sin brought into the world. God, things that we experience today. But Heavenly Father, oh, if we can see, if we can see through the mist of our sorrows and our tears and our pain, if we can see that thou art good, God, what a difference it makes. I pray, Father, that you'd help us today. I ask you to take these lips of clay and God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. God, give me the words that you would have me to speak and may thy spirit May thy spirit do his work in every heart this year. Father, if there's one here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, haven't, hasn't received you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today that, God, they will receive Christ. And I pray, Father, that everyone here who is saved, that will realize what a glorious, glorious thing thou hast done for us in giving us eternal life. Lord, have your way. Glorify thy son. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. You know, the Bible, beloved, is a book of salvation, of God's salvation. It, it's good news, the gospel. That's what the word gospel means, good news. It's the good news that God, beloved, has made a way for fallen sinful man to be saved, to be saved. In the, in the book of John, John chapter 3, verse 16, God gives us the gospel in a nutshell. Now, listen to what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the, the story of the Bible, folks. That's the gospel, the good news. Because in this one verse, beloved, we see that God loves the world. He loves all of humanity. There's no one here that God does not love, that God does not love. We see that God, beloved, uh, that he desires to save man. Why was God desired to save man? Because as we are, we are perishing. We are dying for our sins. We are perishing. Oh, but God desires, beloved, to save man. We see that Christ died, beloved, for the, uh, for the sins of the entire world that they might be saved. He died for, for the sins of the world, for my sin, for your sin. And we see, beloved, the prerequisite for this salvation, that is, beloved, they must believe, amen? They must believe, whosoever believeth, that they not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, it's such a, a simple verse. Yet, beloved, it is so deep and so true. In fact, it's so simple, beloved, that many are blinded by its simplicity. They're blinded by it. Beloved, they're blinded to the point that they don't really understand that verse. So that's what I want to do this morning. I want to lay out for you the backstory of John 3, 16, a verse that probably everybody here knows. So, that when, beloved, you hear it, when you hear this verse or you read this verse, you truly understand, beloved, what this verse is saying. Now, listen very carefully. In the beginning, 
God had a plan. He had a plan. It was a simple plan, beloved, that would fulfill, get this, the longing of God's heart. God had a longing for this. And God made a plan for it. You see, God's plan was, beloved, to create a being in his own image, an image bearer of God, an eternal being. Now, now get this. Please get this. Beloved, he wanted to create a being who was capable of loving God and, and of trusting God. Loving and trusting God. One that God could love back. But it had to be a creature with a free will. With a free will. One, one beloved who would choose to love God. One beloved who would choose to trust God. Who, who, who would be... Uh, in other words, beloved, uh, one who, who wouldn't, uh, who, who, one who would love God because he wanted to love God and would trust God. Oh, God could, God could have made man without a free will. God could, amen? amen. He could. He could have decreed that man will love him. He could have decreed that man will trust him. But beloved, if God had done that, then, then that love and trust wouldn't have been real. It wouldn't have been real. It would have been forced. It would have been disingenuine love disingenuine trust. It would have been forced on man by God. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> suppose, suppose I had the power to force my will on Martha. Boy, that, that's a good idea, huh? I mean, I like that idea. Suppose I had the power. Suppose when Martha and I were dating that I had the power to force my will on her. Suppose, beloved, I could rearrange her mind and her emotions and make her love me. If I could, could, could have, have made, uh, made her trust me, would that have been genuine love? Would that have been genuine trust? No. See, for, for it to be real and to be genuine trust, beloved, real love, real trust, it must come, beloved, from the, uh, her own free will. Amen? For her own free will. And that's how it was with God. God wanted, beloved, a being that would love him, a being, beloved, that would trust him of their own free will will but more than that but also included in that God wanted them to have a deep love for him a deep trust for him God wanted man beloved to trust and love him uh, with a deep love a deep trust not beloved a flighty love y'all know what a flighty love is Come on, you know. Look, I went through that when I was dating Martha. She loved me one week and hate me the next. No, they had to have a flighty, I mean a, a deep love. Not, beloved, a love that was here when things were good, but was gone when things got bad. They had to have a trust, beloved, that would, would trust God when things were bad as well as when things were good. He wanted, beloved, them to have a trust that, that, that appeared, but that, not, not a trust that appeared in the good times, but disappeared in the bad times. That's what, that, beloved, that was the creature that God wanted. That was the desire of his heart, beloved. A, 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 love, a one who would choose to love and trust him deeply, no matter what, no matter the circumstances. 
real love, real trust. So this was the desire of God's heart. So what did God do? Folks, he took six days and he created the universe. He created this world, this world. Beloved, he created a place that for this creature to dwell. And believe me, beloved, it was paradise. Oh, it was all good. It was all perfect. But the Lord wasn't through. He took the sixth day and he created man. Male and female created he them, the Bible says. And oh, let me tell you, beloved man was everything that God desired. I mean, beloved, uh, God, he was made in God's image. He was perfect in every way. And, and oh, how God loved him. And how those, those two creatures loved God. They loved show his great love for man. God, beloved, made a, a garden. Oh, he made a paradise within paradise. With every tree, beloved, that was good for food in that garden. A place, beloved, for man to, to dwell. The garden of Eden. And in that garden, God gave him everything he needed to be happy, to be happy. First, beloved, he gave him a relationship with God. Let me tell you something, folks. That, that man, Adam, and you and I were made for God. We were made for God. And beloved, listen... We have, he had, we have been designed to fellowship with God, to know God, to walk with God, to love God. And because of that, beloved, listen to me, man can never, ever, ever be satisfied, never be happy without, beloved, the, that closeness, that relationship with his creator. There is a God-shaped void in you. I know you've heard that before. A God-shaped void that only God can fill. You were made that way. You were made to have that relationship with God. Second, God gave him like companionship. God gave him, beloved, someone like himself, but different. Different in some way. In other words, God gave him a wife, a wife. And ladies, I want you to know you are something special. You are something special. I finally got some amens I could hear. <laughs> Fellas, that wife completed Adam. She complete, you are a completer, ladies. When I, when I counsel with, with, with young couples getting married, I always tell that wife, you complete him. You make him complete. She completed man, beloved. She added that, 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 that Adam needed. For the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me, a help me. And he made the woman. And oh, Adam was so happy. He was so glad. Here was one like unto him, a companion. The third thing that God gave to man. Some of you ain't going to like this was fulfilling work, work. You know that work, beloved, we were made by God to work. And I'm going to tell you, the worst feeling in the world is to get up in the morning 
with no purpose, with no meaning to your life. People, people look at work and, and beloved, they, they look at it, at it as a trial, as something that they try to avoid. But actually, beloved, it is an essential part of our makeup. Beloved, it's something we need to be satisfied. Boy, I ain't getting no amens now. We need that work. Boy, I'm telling you, we need to spread that message all across this United States. You know that? We need that. God made us to work. So there they were, God's perfect creatures, beloved, with all they needed to be fulfilled physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And everything, everything was so good. Beloved, God loved them. They loved God. They trusted God. And everything was good. But you remember what we said before? God wanted creatures who would love and trust him even if things went bad. Even, beloved, if things got hard. What, what if things got bad? Would they still love God? Would they still, beloved, trust God? I mean, God had blessed them with everything. Everywhere they looked was the blessings of God for them and to them. Would they still love God? Would they still trust God? What if the whole world became a battlefield? What if, what if, beloved, uh, it, it were to become a place of, uh, uh, of, of suffering, a place of pain, a place of sorrow, a place of sadness, a place of trial, a place of hurt? Would man, beloved, look through the midst of all of that and still see that God is good and love him and trust him? Could he endure all of that and still love God? Still trust God. Enter the serpent. Who is the serpent? Satan himself, beloved. Folks, God had given man everything he needed. Everything to fulfill uh, and satisfy all these many, many, many blessings God had given him. Folks, only one thing did God forbid, just one, that he not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree to the knowledge of good and evil. That was, that was, beloved, that was the only thing that God forbid. One commandment God gave them, one thou shalt not. But then the serpent, Satan, came to Eve. It all started, folks, with a question. Just a simple question. Yea, hath God said? Isn't that simple? Yea, hath God said? In other words... Did God really say that? Was it God that said that? Did, did, did he really mean that? Folks, with that question in their mind, man began to question what shouldn't be questioned. What shouldn't be questioned. You see, God had spoken. Amen? God who had created everything. God, who had blessed them with so much, with everything. God has spoken. And that should have been enough. That should have settled it right there. Now, it's true. It's true from the text. It seems, beloved, that Eve didn't hear God say that. Adam did. 
But Adam, beloved, had passed it on to her. <laughs> and no doubt he did that because he loved her and he didn't want her to touch that tree or, or take up that fruit. So just, beloved, as we have had God's word passed down to us by the prophets, by godly men, by our fathers, by godly men, so Eve, beloved, had God's word passed to her by a godly man, her husband. But here was a serpent, a serpent who had never done anything for Eve, anything for man. He had never, beloved Eve, never even shed a tear for them, much less loved them. And he was putting this question into her mind. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Folks, that was the beginning of the downfall of man, the beginning. She told Satan, she said, we can eat of every tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it or touch it, lest ye die. Lest ye die. You know what she should have said? She should have said, God said it, that settles it. Get away from me, devil. Get away from me. But it was too late now because she was conversing with the wicked one, the master of deception. And she, beloved, allowed him to put doubt in her, her heart concerning what God had said, Satan, beloved, saw this and he lowered the boom. Verse 4, ye shall not surely die. Hey, God is just trying to keep something good for you, a fr good from you. God, God knows if you eat of that tree that your eyes will be open and you'll know good and, and you'll be as God's. Oh, God's trying to keep something good from you. So she took from that tree and she gave it to Adam. And folks, they fell. They fell into sin. They disobeyed God. They sinned. They disobeyed the Lord who had blessed them with so much. The God that had blessed them, beloved, with everything. They sinned against him. when they realized they had sinned against God, what did they do? They did what men do today. They ran and hid. They didn't go to God and say, Father, I am so sorry. You are so good. You've been so good to me. You have blessed us and we have sinned. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive him. They ran and hid from God. Folks, they started the religion of the, of the fig leaves. What do you mean, preacher? They, their eyes were open and they saw, beloved, their sin. And so they made, sewed fig leaves together to hide, beloved, their sin from God. Now notice this. Notice this. That is exactly what man does today. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Do we run to God? We run to this one that loves us so much and take his way of salvation. No, people run from God and they hide behind fig leaves. Fig leaves of their own making, of their own making. 
God came, now get this, God came looking for them. They had wronged God, amen? Come on. But they came, but God came, they didn't go looking God. God came looking them. Oh, how great is God's love to do that. Oh, after, after all of God's goodness and all of God's mercy on them, and, and they run from God, and God comes looking them. Oh, how much he loves them. How much he loves them. So, God came looking for them. Why? Such is God's love. Such is God's love for, for sinners, for you and for me, as it was for Adam and Eve. God called to them, Where art thou, Adam? Where art thou, Adam? I love you. Where art thou? That's what God does, beloved, to lost sinners today. He calls us. He calls you to him. God saw, beloved, their fig leaf aprons. I don't think God laughed at it. But you think about it, it's almost comical. Fig leaf aprons to cover their nakedness. To cover, beloved, their sin. Their sin. God looked at that. And God said, no, no, that will not do. That will not cover your iniquity. That will not hide your sin. It won't do it. So what did God do? Did he say, okay, okay, you, you, you've made your choice. I gave you a free will. I blessed you beyond compare. And this is what you did. You will die in your sin. Is that what God said? No, no, no. He could have. But he loved them. He loved them. Instead, in verse 15, look at verse 15. Y'all bear with me. Verse 15, he's speaking to the serpent. This is what God said. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Beloved, God gave them the promise, listen, the promise of the Messiah, of the Savior. He told Satan, there's going to come one of the seed of woman. Man's not going to have anything to do with it. The seed of woman. In other words, a virgin birth. And this one will bruise uh, uh, your head. He'll destroy you, Satan. He will kill you. He will destroy you. And all this that you've done. And you will bruise his heel. You'll hurt him, but you won't, you won't damage him. That's the first promise that God gives of promising a Messiah that's coming. That's coming. And then, beloved, God gave them the promise. Listen to me. In verse 21, he gave them the promise of the blood atonement. Verse 21, let's read that again. Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of sin, skin and clothe them. How did God do that? He shed blood. Coats of skin. Beloved, he shed blood. And I think probably it was a lamb. He killed a lamb. And he took, beloved, that coat and he covered them and he said, now you are covered. Now your sin is, is gone. Now it's, it's atoned for. What was he saying? He was saying without 
the shedding of innocent blood. Your sins cannot be atoned. It takes blood, innocent blood, to pay for your sin. To pay for your sin. Folks, Adam and Eve sinned. They were the prize. They were the highest of God's creation. God, beloved, told them a Messiah was coming. He told them that was going to destroy the works of Satan. And he told them, beloved, that, that, a one, that this one that was coming would shed his blood, his innocent blood, to atone for their sin. But they had another problem. You see, when they disobeyed and and they brought sin into the world. They were the highest of God's creation. So when they sinned, beloved, they brought sin down upon all creation. Upon all creation. Beloved, the world from then on would be full of suffering, full of sorrow, full of pain, full of want, full of death, beloved, full of hard, hard toil. But there in the garden was the tree of life. The tree of life. If they ate of that tree, Adam and Eve would never die. Somebody says, whoa, preacher, that's wonderful. No, no. That was bad. Because if they ate of that tree, listen, they would live forever in a world of suffering and pain and sorrow, a, a world of sin. You young ones are not going to understand this. You around my age, you might. You probably will. The older you get, the tighter you get. Amen? You see a lot. You feel a lot of pain throughout your life. You cry a lot of tears. And when you get older, you get tired of the pain. You get tired of the suffering. You get tired of the struggle. You get tired, beloved, of, uh, 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 of the hurt. You get tired of the sadness. You get tired of, of, of all the things that sin has brought into this world. And you long for paradise again. You know, that's what God made us for, paradise. You long for heaven. You long for heaven. You long for you long for it. Folks, God didn't want those that he loved to live forever in suffering and pain and sorrow. So he cast them from the garden and he set cherubims on a flaming sword to keep guard over the way to the true of life. You say, preacher, that sounds like judgment to me. You know what? If you'll check, many times when God judges, there's mercy and grace in it. That this was God, beloved, blessing them to keep them from living forever in pain and sorrow and death and struggle. Now the descendants of Adam, they went out from the presence of the Lord into a world of sorrow, of sickness, of pain, trial, and death. Would they still love God? Will they, would they still trust God, trust his promises, trust in his goodness? No. The vast majority would not. Would not. But there was a remnant who did. There was a remnant that still believed God, that still loved God, that still trusted God, that still knew that God was good. While the rest of the world sought happiness and fulfillment 
in earthly things because they had lost the real happiness and fulfillment in the garden. Beloved, they sought happiness in agriculture, in architect, in, in music, in the arts, in the accumulation of wealth, in the accumulation of power. They sought it and they sought it, but they could never feel that empty longing inside of them for God. So they made their own gods. False gods, idols that they could control. And they bow to their false gods. Oh, but men like Enoch and Abraham, Noah, Job, men like Moses and David and Daniel, beloved, and a host of others kept worshiping, kept serving, kept trusting, and believing in, the, in God and his promises even through the troubles and trials and suffering and sorrow. And they knew real happiness. They knew real peace. Because they knew God. I want y'all to look at me. I know I'm not pretty. Look at me for just a minute. I'm at peace. I have joy. You want to see? I got it. I got joy. I'm not going to try that again. I got joy. I'm happy. You say, preacher, look at all that's going on. I see it. I know that God is good. I trust him. I believe in him. I believe in his promises. And I got peace. And I got joy. After 4,000 years, it happened. God Gave his only begotten son. Gave him to be the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. And to all who will believe on him, he takes their sins away. He, beloved, reconciles them back with God. God, their creator, he gives them eternal life and he gives them a new nature and he gives them, beloved, they are adopted into the family of God and they become heirs with Christ of all the riches and glories in heaven. Amen. To those who believe, folks, those are the people that God planned for in the beginning. Those are the people that God desired, beloved, with all of his heart when he created man. People who would love him as God and trust him as God willingly, even though they live in a world of sickness and pain and sorrow and death. Do you see? Do you see, beloved, the back story to John 3.16? Do you see it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, we are all sinners. Sinners by nature and by action. But God, God, in his great love has made a way of salvation for those who will believe. And it's the only way. It's the only way. God has put before us life and death, like old Joshua in the Old Testament. Told the people, put before you life and death. Choose life. Choose life. 
listen, you can hide. You can hide behind fig leaves. Hide behind the lies of the world. Hide behind religion. Hide behind good works. Hide behind church membership. Hide behind even atheism. Hide behind it. It will not suffice. It will not hide your sin from God. Only the blood of Christ can save you. Only his innocent blood. And that only by believing on him. By believing on him. God is looking for a people. A people, beloved, who are the people he intended them to be. People who willingly love him as he loves us. People, beloved, who will trust him, believe his promises. Is that person you? Is it you? I want you to stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed.